welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Matthew Dunn and I'll be talking about the non-medical use of anabolic androgenic steroids and what I see are the challenges faced by the AOD and medical fields. Uh, to those who are watching the recording, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to do so. I know it's very easy to say that you are going to watch a recording, um, and I know that often it's difficult to follow through with that. Um, I teach students who often say that they're going to watch my lectures and never do, so um, I do appreciate you turning up. As mentioned, this is being recorded and the questions will be answered at the end. Uh, I am conscious of the time of the afternoon, and I know that everyone's probably had a very long day. Um, so. You can just watch this and leave, um, or you can stay around for the, com uh, the questions at the end. So before I start going on uh, about this topic, I want to go through a couple of scenarios um, for you. So the first one is about Jake, the aspiring bodybuilder. So let's pretend that you're a GP in a busy inner city clinic, and one day you see a new patient, and it's Jake. Uh, you notice he's from a regional area and he mentions that he's working in the city uh, so it's easier for him to come to this clinic and then go to his um, normal GP at home. Uh, Jake is a 26 year old male, he's training hard at the gym, he's eating very strictly, um, his uh, training is pretty strict as well. Uh, he tells you that he wants to be an, a, a bodybuilder, he's aspiring to get into the bodybuilding scene. Uh, he's, uh, in the past, uh, a couple of weeks or about a month or so, decided that he wants to experiment using performance and image enhancing drugs. So he goes to another bodybuilder at his gym and gets advice. And this other bodybuilder says, uh, for your first cycle, I want you to take 750 milligrams of Test D, uh, 300 milligrams of Deca, and some Nolva. Uh, Jake does that for several weeks uh, and notices that he gets really bad acne on his chest and it's gotten so bad to the point where he's not wearing a tank top to the gym, he's not taking his shirt off at the beach and he's quite worried. He's gone back to the bodybuilder that he got the advice from and said that he um, is experiencing these effects and he wants to uh, probably stop using what he's using. But the bodybuilder says, look, no need to do that just drop down to 250 milligrams of test um, and, and you should be fine. Uh, so he does that, but the acne is getting worse and that's why he's come to you. Um, he was, before he came to you, uh, seeking advice from another friend because the acne is just getting really worse and he's really worried. This is the first time he's done a cycle. So his friend, uh, who he knows uses steroids, said, look, um, take some Oritane, take 10 milligrams a day um, and you should be fine. Um, and if you want to come off the steroids, probably use some HCG, some aromacin and some clomiphene as well. Um, and so he's done that, uh, but the, the acne is getting really worse. And so he's, he's come to you. The second scenario uh, is Ahmed. So he's a regular patient of yours. Um, he comes in for some advice. He tells you that he has used steroids in the past and he's thinking about doing another cycle. He's familiar with a range of substances, so test PE, trend A, MAST, um, and he's used some oral steroids in the past as well. His next cycle, he's planning on doing 800 milligrams of test 400 weekly, uh, 600 milligrams of equipoise weekly, and 50 milligrams of Androl daily. He's come to you because he wants to get his bloods done. Um, he's never done this before, but the other guys at the gym say that he really should get his, his bloods done before he goes on cycle, um, during cycle, and then when he comes off cycle, um, and he's come to you for some advice about that. For both those scenarios, and if, the, if we were doing this face-to-face, um, -face, I would go through and ask you, and you don't have to be a GP for this, because I have no doubt that if you're an NSP worker, or if you're a, even a counsellor, or someone that's in the front line of the alcohol and other drug sector, you're probably seeing something similar to this at some point, or you're worried that, you're, that you might do. I want you later on, and we can talk about this in the Q&A section, um, for both scenarios, think about how would you react to this? Um, what would you do? Where would you start? Are you equipped to deal with these scenarios? Do you know anyone that you could refer to or that you could seek um, guidance from? And what other information would you need to be able to provide care to these patients or to the person that comes to see you? And I guess the, the question that, um, I would like to start us thinking about is, do you even provide that care? 
because this is becoming more of a reality for medical practitioners, but also, as I said, for frontline AID workers, whether you are in an NSP or any other frontline clinic. Um, and I think now is the time that we really start to consider our role um, that we play and the position that this group of substance consumers has in our fields. Um, and if you've experienced something like this and you'd be willing to share your experience at the end of this webinar, then I'm more than happy for you to do so, or you can do so privately with me um, at a later date. I'm more than happy to hear from people. Um, I recently had dinner with a group of GPs and this came up and, and we were meeting to discuss how GPs talk about this. And what was really interesting to me was that all of the GPs who knew each other that came from similar clinics in different parts of Victoria thought they were the only ones that were seeing this. And um, I think we kind of need to start having these discussions and now is a really good time to do that. So this afternoon, I really tried to pitch this webinar at people who don't know much about this topic or who know a little bit, but would like to have more of the picture. And by no means will I fill in the whole picture because it's a very large one, uh, but I really wanna give you the information that if you don't know much about this or anything at all, that you can take this information or walk away and be a little bit more confident than where you are now. And maybe even if you are seeing this client group or this, this patient group, be able to um, have those conversations. So this webinar will provide an overview of the types of substances people use, uh, outline the purposes for use and the context within which they are used, present the short and long-term effects experienced, and then consider how the medical and broader AOD community can engage this group. So who am I and why am I talking about this? Um, I am Matthew Dunn. I um, am a steroid researcher, um, which sounds a lot more fancy than kind of what it is. And if you could see the lower part of me, you would know that I um, don't really fit the, the profile of someone that would be um, researching these like many people think that I, I do. Um, so I have a psychology background. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Sydney. I looked at the influence of drug use, exercise and sexual orientation on body image concerns in men. And I graduated with that in 2006. Uh, the main part of that PhD and that drug use component was looking at steroids um, as well as recreational drug use. Um, I've got a number of other qualifications that matter nothing to this webinar. Um, I started work at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the University of New South Wales in 2005, um, and I worked on the EDRS and the Illicit Drugs in Sport projects uh, before I came down here to Melbourne at Deakin University, uh, where I have been since. Uh, my primary research stream is um, steroid use, and I've published papers looking at the prevalence of use in different groups, um, things that might predict who might use these substances. And in recent times, I've really focused on looking at how this group takes care of themselves because there is a, a real um, thought that this group are just a bunch of meatheads who go to the gym, lift really heavy things, put them down again, and that's it. And that really is a stereotype. And so the research that I've been doing is looking at how they share information and how, that use that, how they use that information um, and how they come into contact with services. And my ultimate goal is really just to empower this group to take care of their health, whether it's when they're using or whether to make that decision not to use, but also to help people like you who might be watching this webinar, um, help that group take care of themselves. Um, and so today I'm hoping is the start of that dialogue. A disclaimer, um, I am not a medical professional, I'm not a GP, I'm not an endocrinologist, I'm not a cardiologist, I'm not an NSP worker, and I'm not an AOD worker um, or AOD nurse. Um, so I'm just putting that out there in case people expect that I, or accuse me of coming from a different angle. Um, all these people will have a different angle and those are important angles. And I love hearing from the different people that come into contact with this group um, because you all have views and experiences that I don't see. Um, just like I have a view and experience you can see. So let's get on with it. So um, I've used the term PEDS um, a couple of times, um, and that term refers to performance and or image enhancing drugs. And that is a broad term that encapsulates a number of substances that are used to enhance performance or body image. 
This term um, is used differently in different countries. So the British will use the, um, the acronym IPED, our image and enhancing performance drugs. Uh, that's just because of their imperialism, imperialistic ways. They like to do things differently. Um, but it, what it encapsulates is a range of substances that do these things. Um, so that can include things that I could go out now and walk into a supermarket or um, a health food shop or a pharmacy or whatever and buy. So a multivitamin. Um, it could include creatine or BCAAs. Uh, if you don't know what those are, that's completely fine. They're sports supplements that you would buy at a sports supplement shop. But it also includes things um, that are used non-medically for these purposes, such as anabolic, anabolic androgenic steroids. I'm just going to call them steroids from here on in. Um, steroids are the most researched uh, or regarding non-medical use um, in terms of the substances uh, that we encapsulate in PEDS. Um, and I'm using the term non-medical for a particular reason. If you haven't read Dr. Bryony Lawrence, Lawrence's paper, uh, I think it was 2011 paper looking at terminology and prescription opioids, I really wouldn't, um, I would encourage you to do so. I think it's a fantastic paper. And it was one of the first to really explore why the language that we use matters. And it was related to prescription opioids. And um, I say non-medical use in this context because we need to remember that steroids have therapeutic uses, um, legitimate therapeutic uses, um, and they just happen to be used non-medically um, for the purposes that I'm going to talk about later on this webinar. Um, so much like the issue of prescription opioids, there can be some murkiness in terms of um, what's being used medically and non-medically, and increasingly we are seeing that with some of this group. There is some indication that people are using these for very valid reasons. They've been to a doctor, they've got a script um, and they're using it um, therapeutically, but they're getting the positive benefits um, in terms of their, their body image or their uh, performance. I don't want to go too much into that other than what I've just said, but it's something that we need to remember um, as we go forward and, and language is really important here. When I use the scenarios, I used a couple of terms. And again, if you didn't understand anything that I said in the scenarios, I hope at the end of this, you will. Um, and so I'm going to use and go over some of the terminology um, now so you get up to speed before I go forward and talk about the rest of the um, what I'm going to talk about today. And the first is cycle. So this refers to the periodic use of steroids. So going back to those uh, scenarios, a patient might indicate that they're cycling on for eight weeks and then they're going to cycle off for eight weeks. The early stages of a cycle or the period of use will probably only involve one steroid and I will cover the types of steroids that people use. Um, and it's probably usually going to be one of the more androgenic ones um, such as testosterone. So going back to that, um, that's one of those scenarios where they mentioned test or test D or whatnot. Um, it will probably also be an oral steroid, and I'll talk about that again um, in a little bit, particularly if a consumer has never used steroids before. So new initiates will probably take an oral steroid, um, while more people more familiar and more comfortable with them um, will inject them intramuscularly. Um, so do remember that these, that these are drugs, they um, are substances. So a person will reach a plateau at some point um, when using them. So to continue making gains um, in terms of your physique or your performance, you're probably going to have to increase your dose. So during that cycle, you might start on a dose and then increase that as you go along in your on cycle. Um, and this means that there's an increased risk of a number of problems that could could crop up. So this is traditionally why there has been the on cycle period and the off cycle period. Um, and that's being advocated. The next is um, post cycle therapy. So in the off cycle period where a person isn't using steroids, uh, the consumer is urged to go on post cycle therapy or PCT um, using substances to help restore normal hormone levels and help keep their gains. Um, and when I talk about gains, I mean the gains that you might get from the gym or from your performance or whatever the case may be. So this appears to be missing part, a missing part of many consumers' regimes um, and something they don't think about until they've come off 
um, what they're using or they have to stop using immediately for whatever reason. Uh, I published a paper a couple of years ago with colleagues, Dr. Fiona Mackay, Dr. Scott Griffiths and Richard Henshaw, and I'm happy to send that to anyone that wants it. Uh, my email will be at the end of this, uh, where we explored this issue. And those uh, consumers talked about the importance of post-cycle therapy. Those who had never thought of it uh, really wished they, they had, and those who advocated discussed that this is something that people need to think about uh, before commencing a cycle. Uh, the next phrase, um, I, I use the terms of blast and cruise, I think, in one of the scenarios, and if I didn't, then I, I miss them. But this is also something that's coming along that's related to the, the period of use. This is where the consumer will start with a really large dose, um, initial larger dose of their steroid for several weeks, then they'll drop down to a smaller dose um, for several weeks before going back up again. So remember with the scenario with Jake, his uh, bodybuilder friend suggested he uses 75, uh, 750 milligrams. Um, and then um, he suggested we'll just drop down to 250 and then drop up again. Uh, so that would be an example of blast and cruise. And I should mention that those scenarios that I used um, are actual scenarios that I took from online forums. Um, so they are things that you, you could actually um, come across. So that cruise period is really a maintenance period where your dose is used to keep your gains, but get your hormones down to a more normal level. So your body doesn't get used to that high level. Uh, here, the consumer isn't getting off their drugs and that introduces a new range of issues. From my interviews and from the work that I've done, there seems to be a generational divide. Your old school bodybuilder will say that you have to do the on and off cycle. So you go on it for eight weeks or whatever the case may be, and then come off it to give your body that time to recover and your body to kick start again. Um, and they accuse the, the new um, school of bodybuilders of doing the blast and cruise. Um, you will find advocates everywhere for either or one or the other. Um, and I'll talk about, when I talk about how we can engage this group, this is one of the things that um, is really interesting. Um, I don't know how generalizable what people have said to me. It, when you look at um, the online forums and people are seeking advice about what they want to do, uh, everyone will have their opinion and you can get lost in that for hours, uh, much like the comments section online. The next term I want to, uh, to um, encourage you to, or uh, to expose you to is stacking. So in that second scenario, Ahmed indicates that he's going to use a number of steroids at the same time. Uh, and we refer to that as stacking. So this might occur when a consumer believes that they've reached the maximum that they can get from just one steroid alone. So I mentioned that plateau. Uh, so they might use um, a range of substances, um, or if they're seeking a particular outcome with their body um, or their performance, then they might use a number of steroids to try and um, to reach that gain. So what steroids do people use? Uh, there's a number of steroids out there, um, just so you know, and um, I want to break them into, um, and again, talking to consumers is, is sometimes the best way to actually get a, a, get a sense of what people use and why. Um, I don't wanna get into the science behind it all because I appreciate that this can be new to a lot of people. Um, if you do have a background in medicine or uh, biology or any of that, then um, I hope these two slides will encourage you to think, well, why would a person use these um, substances? What are the things that I might wanna look at uh, for if a patient comes into my clinic um, or asks me a question, um, what are the things I want to look at? What if I was going to test someone uh, for health issues related to steroid use? What would I test for? Um, so with there are two categories of steroids. So there are the ones that are going to help with mass. Um, so if you're trying to what we call a bulking phase, if you're trying to put on size. Um, and there are those that you would use if you wanted to put on lean mass. And again, there's probably going to be people that will argue one side or the other. Um, and so this is not gospel. This is just kind of a general guide for you. So let's look at these three bulking ones. I've just taken the main ones that I see um, in the forums and when I talk to guys. So the first on the right is methandrostenolone. Um, I'm always going to get that wrong. Um, but its trade names are Diana Bowl or Danabol or Avabol, and it's an oral steroid. So remember I mentioned earlier that some are injectable, some are oral. Uh, the second is oxymethylone, and it has trade names such as Anadrol, and it's also a steroid. 
Um, and then the third is testosterone cipionate or testo testosterone enanthate, uh, which is an injectable one. Um, these are really going to help with bulking, but they also tend to be estrogenic, which means they're going to lead to fat and water retention, which does actually help with that bulking look, but it can lead to some negative side effects or unwanted side effects more than negative. Um, they are negative, but some this group tends to see these things as just a byproduct of using these, these substances. Um, and the main one is gynecomastia um, or um, they, some people call them bitch tits. Uh, it's just the uh, enlargement of breast tissue in males. Um, so that is a, um, a side effect. So in this instance, a person may know if they're using these substances that that could be a side effect. So they might take an anti-estrogen as well. And in a couple of slides, I'm gonna look at some of the other substances that people might use. Uh, the second category, as I said, is the lean mass group. So these are, uh, there are a few in this category and again, I've just gone for the, the main three. Um, the first is nandrolone decanate, um, which is an injectable one. Its trade name, it, trade name is Deca Durabilin or just Deca um, is, is usually what it's referred to. Uh, the second is oxandrolone, uh, which is sold as Anavar and it's an oral steroid. And the third is Stenozolol, which has a number of names, but Winstrol is one of the main ones. So as I said, these are the major ones, uh, the steroids, these two categories and these six. You might also come across Trembolone, which is used for bulking. Um, this is a really interesting one. When you talk to guys and when you uh, look at the online forums, most guys will try and avoid that one. And the anecdotal evidence from some of the people that I've spoken to is that if you have any aggressive tendencies, uh, this is the one that's really gonna bring those out. So a lot of them try and avoid it. Um, I don't want to go too far into the relationship between steroids and violence. I will touch upon it a little bit later, but um, self-report is that that's the one that's probably going to pull out some of some of those tendencies. So people will use other substances, as I mentioned, and I'm not going to go fully into those, um, but it is worth knowing. Um, these consumers take uh, the steroids that they want to take, but a host of other substances to counteract the negative effects, such as the anti-estrogens, but also perhaps to support the effects of the steroids that they're taking. Um, you should just be aware of these, that if you are coming into contact with someone that mentions that they're using steroids, um, or that they have, or you suspect that they are, that there's a chance that they're using something else. Uh, for instance, if you're doing um, as one of the steroids for lean mass, you might also use a fat loss um, substance like clenbuterol. Um, if you've got the water retention, you might use the diuretic. If you're getting that enlargement of the breast tissue, uh, you might use the anti-estrogen. Um, if you're on post-cycle therapy, you might use one of the peptides or you may even use that while you're using the steroid. So again, um, that's, uh, this is a good thing that you can use if you're coming into contact with this group as a way of that dialogue. So if they're mentioning they use a steroid, so are you use, what else are you using? Are you having any of these effects and so forth? The one that really concerns me is insulin. And this has um, a, lot of, a lot of concerns in the community and a lot of debate. Uh, I'm not gonna get into that today, but my colleague, Dr. Maya Underwood from the University of Queensland is presenting on this at the APSAD conference um, coming up in Auckland. So if you're going to that, then do come along uh, to that session because it is the one that really worries me. Insulin is not something that you um, mess around with. So who consumes and why? I, I think trying to work out who consumes um, and having a typology, I think it's useful, but I don't think it's the most useful thing that we can do. Um, we, our data is not crash hot in terms of prevalence. Um, our data systems in Australia don't collect, uh, either don't collect that information very well, um, or they're just not good at collecting data on substances of very hidden populations, of which steroid users um, are one of those. I think it's better probably to look at the why of why people use them. Uh, so traditionally, elite athletes have been one of the main groups reported to use these substances. And back in the, the kind of 80s and 90s, this was the group that everyone focused upon. And that really makes sense because these are called performance and image enhancing drugs. So they enhance performance. We know it does. And so it doesn't 
it, it's not rocket science that people would use them if they're an elite athlete. Some studies suggest that these performance gains aren't all that much. If you're a very talented natural athlete with all the coaching and all the, the training that goes into it, it's suggested that these substances don't add a lot. But if you think about Sally Pearson won her gold medal at the London Olympics by, by 0.02 of a second. And if you ever watch swimming, um, which I do, uh, you see just the, the stupid times that people win by the fractions. And so if this is giving you that edge, then that becomes attractive. We all know the Tour de France. Um, professional cycling, is, cycling has had an issue, and that, that's one of those reasons. These, you don't do the Tour de France if you're a rubbish athlete. You've got to be already a really top-notch, in-physique, in-conditioned um, athlete, but these are probably just adding a little bit more. But the research with these cyclists um, suggests that it isn't just cut and dry as to win. Um, so this comes from, uh, this is a quote from a study by uh, my colleague, Dr. Martin Hardy, um, uh, several years ago, who he did a study with professional cyclists. And as this cyclist said, I'd like to give you one straight answer, but I can't. Amateurs do it to turn professional. Professionals do it to keep a job. But then you've also got the high-end guys, like guys who are winning tours and are multi, on multi-million dollar contracts, are still doing it. You can't say it's for the money. You have to look a bit deeper and say it's probably not peer pressure, but pressure to perform and pressure they put themselves put on themselves and pressure to win. And I think this is kind of an, an apt quote uh, given the issues uh, that's just come out around uh, professional cricket here in Australia and that win at all costs. So um, is that pressure... Does it manifest in different reasons? Someone might take a performance enhancing drugs. Uh, someone might rub a ball with sandpaper. Uh, the second group that we've always targeted um, is bodybuilders, and that kind of makes sense. Um, this quote comes from a really great study back in 2007. Once you are a bodybuilder, other bodybuilders just accept you. They look at you as a world above everyone else. Um, so... We've got some really great work coming out back from um, to the early 2000s and this piece of work, uh, but also more recently. So colleagues of mine, Dr. Katinka van der Ven and Dr. Carl, Carl Marooney, and even Dr. Maya Underwood are doing some great studies looking at how this community works and functions because, again, there is a stereotype about them. And once you get into that community, you realise that um, it is actually a community and um acceptance is one of those things um, and they yeah so I, I think that's that's really this quote kind of sums that up um, so there is some work coming out looking at typologies of users and and so forth and that's interesting but um, the literature tends to identify three main reasons um, historically so body image performance enhancement and occupation so there is a large volume of literature to support the notion that men have body image concerns. This is not new. Um, when I did my PhD, the issues really focused upon that drive for uh, leanness and thinness. And it was focused, the literature was focusing on eating disorders and so forth. Um, but my work was focusing on that drive for muscularity and that's really now a thing. Um, Remember with those two types of steroids, I talked about the bulking and the lean, the lean mass. So it, depending on what you want to do is depending on what, you, what steroid you might use. So there is that bulk and that muscle, that, that look, but there's also, I guess, that what you might see in the movies, that really lean body mass and a decreased body fat. And of course, there is the strength that comes with that. Um, you need to, if you want to grow your muscles, com continually... Um, fatigue them and challenge them. And um, if you want to lift, lift heavy things, you need to have that strength. And with changing your body image comes that increased social feedback and that confidence. Um, several years ago, there was, this is from the news.com.au website and don't judge me for looking at that site. Um, but one of the, the um, issues was, should music festivals ban bare chests? Um, because that was what we were seeing at um, those music festivals, is guys going in and uh, taking their tops off. Um, and one music festival did. But if you're going to festivals, this is what you're seeing. And there are guys that will spend their year conditioning their bodies to be at peak for a music festival or a dance party or something similar. And with looking like this comes that 
that feedback when you walk into a music festival or uh, any environment, I guess, and you, and you look like this. Um, but imagine you're not a, you're a guy that doesn't look like this. Uh, so you go to a festival or you go somewhere, you see what other guys look like. What's that going to do to you? We see it in the media. And so many of you have probably seen this. If you haven't, then um, Professor Harrison Pope from Harvard um, has done, did, a, did the groundbreaking breaking study looking at the changes in action figures and the dimensions of those figures. Uh, he came to the APSAD conference in Melbourne last year um, and that was recorded. So I, if you're really interested in this topic, do, do look at the APSAD YouTube channel um, and you can find his keynote. It's utterly fant uh, fascinating. And these uh, action figures do make an appearance. They travel the world with him. Uh, but we see this, um, so these are what uh, video game characters look like these days. Um, this is what young, young men or men are being exposed to. And I hear you say, well, women have always been exposed to that. That's true. And social media now is, is where it's all happening. Um, this is what women are seeing um, and the slogans that come with it. Uh, but this is what men are seeing as well. Um, and uh, the whole way that social media portrays some of this, this issue, I think, um, is leading to some of the issues that we're seeing, particularly in body image um, problems and mental health problems. And again, um, Dr. Scott Griffiths at Melbourne University is doing a lot of work on this. The next group is the performance enhancement. So yes, it is the elite athletes. And I think we would be naive to think that it's not, but it's also those sub elite athletes and those weekend warriors. These substances do increase strength and endurance, um, and they help you get the body that will do the things that you want on the sporting field. They do help recover after intense activity or even injury. I think we're seeing this now because sport is a legitimate career and there's been the commercialization of sport. My 12 year old nephew um, wants to be an elite athlete. He wants to be an AFL player. Um, that's actually a career option for him. When my father who swam for Australia decades ago, um, he gave it up because uh, that wasn't a, a career. You didn't get paid for it and he wanted to have a family. So he left um, competitive sport. Um, but now it's, a, it's an actual thing that you can do, but there are limited spots. So um, you have to be the best of the best. And if you are an elite athlete, all it takes is one niggling injury to wipe you out of your career. Um, so if you need something that might help you recover or reach the peak or even go further than that, then um, these substances can do it. But it's also occupations. And so we, we see and we hear about use amongst prison officers, bouncers, personal trainers, manual laborers, and models. Um, so this, um, these two quotes are from a study uh, from 2010, I think it was uh, from South Australia. And it was really interesting. The first is from a bouncer. It's just the look, you know, if people see me at 71 kilos, they think that I am nothing and they can walk all over me. But if they see me at 95 kilos, completely different story, you know, no one will talk back to you at that weight. And as a personal trainer said, basically in my industry it is a very competitive industry. So if for what, so for one, if you are looking bigger and you look good, that probably being on the steroids just gives you the upper hand. I don't see these three reasons, three, um, reasons for use as um, standing in isolation. I think they really are interconnected. So the personal trainer who decides to use for their job benefits from looking good. The athlete who takes them to enhance their performance may also want to enhance, enhance performance because being an athlete is their job. Um, the manual laborer who has got a slight, um, uh, a niggling injury uses it because it enhances their performance, but helps them um, recover for their job. So these motivations are interconnected and I think we can't look at use in isolation. I think it does um, have to look at um, come together. So the effects, um, before I talk about the effects, there's a couple of caveats here. Um, Firstly, as I've mentioned several times, no one just takes one substance. You might just take one steroid, um, but you're probably going to take something else if you continue using. Um, so we don't have a good understanding of what each substance might do. Um, again, going back to um, Ahmed, he's taking a couple of steroids and he might take a growth hormone, he might take something else um, when he comes off. 
Secondly, people cycle on and off um, traditionally. So what happens to your body in the long term if you're cycling on and coming off? What, what, what does that do? We don't have great data on that. Um, and doses are greater than in a clinical setting. So for those of you that are um, medically trained, you've noted the doses in those scenarios are a lot higher than what you would um, probably prescribe someone therapeutically. So we've got a good understanding kind of of what, what those doses do. Um, you just have to look at these guys and, and I do talk about guys um, because we don't have good data on women. Um, but you know, we know what they do, we just don't know what they're doing internally, particularly over the long term. But with those caveats, the physical effects. Um, I did a review of all the Australian literature um, several years ago, and these are what um, these are the self-reported um, physical effects. Um, I'll allow you to read those, but the really the, the main ones that come out are things like acne and headaches. Those types of things, we see them as negative effects. I think they see them as nuisance effects. And again, you might decide that you want to. Um, just uh, take something to counteract those. So if you've got um, swelling, you might take something to um, counteract that. But then there are other things like liver problems and kidney problems and lymph node swelling um, and heart problems. Harrison Pope, and I do urge you to go watch that, um, that recorded keynote because he does talk about, we're seeing the guys that use them in the 80s and the 90s come into middle age. What does that mean? Um, and we, we need to get a better sense of that. Um, but these are the self-reported effects and they are the things that the guys talk about that they are concerned about. Um, make no mistake about that. They do, um, they do worry about what these substances are doing and if they know something is not working or there's going to be a negative effect, they will do something about that. We have the psychological effects. Um, so mental health problems, there are self-reported aggression, particularly related to some of the specific steroids. They do report some depression, um, irritability, anxiety. Um, some might report impulsivity, some might report fatigue. The issue around um, libido and erectile dysfunction comes up quite frequently. Um, you know, guys might say that they've got absolutely no libido um, or they're really, really, horny and uh, apologies for that word while they're taking steroids but when they come off it um, they've just got nothing in the tank um, so that is something that comes up then there's the injecting related harms um, I'm, I'm going to just focus upon this for a little bit because it's it's an issue that comes up and again if we're talking about how we can engage with this group um, it's something that we need to consider if we look at this issue from a public health lens then yes we are concerned about injecting related harm. We need to take into account though that consumers don't see this as an issue and get actually quite offended when you bring it up. Um, we know that steroid consumers have low levels of bloodborne viruses such as HIV and Hep C. Um, they engage in less bloodborne um, risk behaviours um, as how we measure it and I think how we measure it is not very good. Um, I think those of you who work in an NSP would probably see this group as a disengaged group from the service as a whole. And that mostly comes from um, the belief that they're not drug users. Um, they don't see themselves as drug users. They don't identify with the other clientele that come into those establishments. Um, I gave a presentation a few months ago talking about this issue and I concluded by saying that we need to engage with this group on the issues they engage with when they engage with it. So when it comes to injecting related harm, I think we don't put this aside. I think we need to keep looking at it, but I think we approach it from a different angle. And I'm really happy to talk to frontline workers and hear from you in, in with regards to how you do this um, and your thoughts on that. So it's, it's an issue, but it's not the biggest issue for this group. Um, a paper has just come out from the Netherlands or several months ago, um, and it was a respective case review of 180 patients who visit a steroid clinic. Um, 96% experienced at least one side effect. Um, those top three are when they were on cycle. So 38% reported acne, 34% reported gynecomastia, and 27% reported agitation. So those are the things that you might consider um, if you are seeing this group and you're thinking about what you might need to look at. Those ones grouped in the green are the ones that they experienced the most off cycle. So that was decreased libido and erectile dysfunction, 34% and 20%.
if you are seeing an Ahmed or seeing someone like that and they're coming in and they're saying, hey, I want to, I want to get my bloods done, um, what should you be looking at? The tests in the literature, um, both the published literature and the underground literature, would suggest things like um, full blood count, kidney and liver function, hormones, lipids, prostate, and ideally doing these pre-cycle to establish that baseline, then on cycle and then post-cycle. Um, I think it most might be, um, not all patients are going to disclose that they're using. And when I mentioned the scenario of Jake, I mentioned that he was coming to a clinic specifically in the city area, not where he lived. And I put that in for a reason. Um, we know, and I've interviewed guys that have said that they will go to a different GP, not where they live, maybe to a, one of the a, a big clinic, bulk billing clinic. They'll say things like, you know, I'm feeling really lethargic or I just have no libido or whatever the case may be. And they'll ask for specific tests to be done. Um, so if you're seeing that, it might be a, uh, a clue to talk about this and bring this up. Um, and they're doing it because they want to get, they want to get these tests. Um, there are websites and, and people that run um, companies that will interpret the tests or a lot of these guys are really, really good um, at knowing what all this means. And so they can decipher the test results and, and themselves. They just need the test done. Uh, so those are something you might consider. So in the last couple of minutes, and I, I've gone longer than I, I wanted to, and I do apologize for that. Um, how can their medical and broader AID community engage this group? Um, I don't pretend to have the answers to this. And again, I want, I want to hear from you. But the first thing I think is services. So what services do this group access and are they inviting? Um, so for example, this client group takes a higher volume of equipment compared to other clients, uh, client groups at NSPs. And there has been this debate in Australia about whether we continue to allow this group to do so. Um, I know that some NSPs have put in uh, a range of measures because the amount of equipment is going. Um, some say, look, this is a, this is a positive response um, from my own research. And I published a few papers about this. Um, one guy might go in and get a whole bunch of, of um, injecting equipment and distribute that in a peer distribution model. Um, and this group takes a lot because they will take enough to last a cycle. So if you're using uh, for eight week cycle and you know, you're going to do a couple of cycles then you might go in once and get it all and not have to go back. Um, how do, I, how do these services look to this group? They don't like going into them. Um, they do respect the people that work in them though. And, and you've got um, a great um, uh, reputation amongst this group. Um, some work, uh, so myself, uh, Katinka Van Deven and Kay Stanton um, have written a little bit about this um, in some of the gray literature. And we thought, you know, if you have a high level of this group coming into your NSP, uh, do you have bodybuilder posters up or if there's a competition coming up, um, any, um, any posters around that? Would that work? I, we don't know. That's a, a suggestion from us, but um, that's just one idea. So it's looking at the services and, and are they inviting? Uh, I think NSPs are great because you are that hub to, to link to other service, services. Um, but again, that's a contentious issue. I realise that. I've mentioned dialogue a lot and consumers really are the best source of information about these substances. Um, so if they do disclose, ask them, why do you use this? Why are you using at this particular level? Um, this group is so knowledgeable about what they're using and they do actually want to be acknowledged for that. They know that their GP may not know anything about this and they know that the NSP worker may not know anything about this. And that's actually okay if you don't have that knowledge because they do. So that's a way that you can engage with them is asking them. Um, and remember that their concerns may not be our concerns and that we need to meet them where they are. So um, asking them what they're using and why is great. Then going into, are you injecting safely? Um, may actually put them off. So it's just about how we approach some of those, those um, topics when we do. So that is the end of my formal presentation. I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, I realize that some people may leave now as we're quarter to six. Uh, those are my contact details. Please don't hesitate to call me or email me, um, but I'm happy to take questions now. Okay, so you can either ask questions in the Q&A um, section that is located at the control panel at the bottom of your screen or using the Zoom webinar chat. And 
you want me to do that? It's up to you, yeah. Wait for something to come through. Um, I'm happy for you to read them out. Okay. There are any questions coming through, Dr. Dunn? That is completely fine. Um, I know it puts people on notice when you ask them for questions, but as I said, I'm more than happy to hear from people um, later on. Um, too soon. There's one just come through. Oh. Um, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Sina Tambi. Um, thank you. He said thank you for a very informative presentation. You are more Eddie. than welcome. Any interactions to be concerned about if they are abusing other drugs? Oh, um, as I said, I am not a medical doctor, so that is a question that I will invite the medical people to discuss. Um, that is a really good question though, in terms of um, illicit drug use. So um, there's a lot of kind of contention in the literature whether this group does use other illicits um, or illicits. I, I'm of the frame of mind that it's a, probably a smaller group. As I said, most people using steroids um, are really into fitness and people laugh when I say this, but they actually see these, they don't think of themselves as doing anything um, unhealthy when they're using these substances. They see them as enhancing or helping them reach their, their full potential. Um, and so don't, don't engage in illicit substance use because um, they see that as unhealthy. That's not the the norm, though. There are um, there are groups where they will use other illicits. Um, so if you are going out and you look like those guys at those music festivals, um, why wouldn't you take cocaine or something like that? And that's a, um, a joking question. But um, and also we do see within the the, the gay uh, and bisexual community. Um, Studies here in Australia particularly have found a relationship between steroid use, um, sexuality and illicit drug use. I think that's more about the, um, the way those studies have been conducted. So um, if you do have a, a patient or a client who is same-sex attracted um, and they're using steroids, then illicits might be a question that you follow up with um, just in terms of that. But um, that's, that's not a hard and fast rule. I'm not generalising. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about the interactions. Um, those more medically inclined than me would be able to answer that. I'm sorry, I can't. Um, the same attendees just typing one more question. Legal no issues is the question. What would you like to know about the legal issues? They are using non-medical steroids. Should we report them? Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm going to leave that up to you. And this is a discussion that we did have with those GPs. Um, if you're a doctor, I'm 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 guessing that you've got confidentiality issues there. Pardon me. Uh, I think. Part of the reason why this group is so distrustful of the medical professional, and I use the medical profession there um, specifically, is for this. Um, they they will do everything in a roundabout way. I can't see me doing my hands there, um, so that they can find out what they want without disclosing. Um, I would probably err on the side of caution and say don't, um, because if you if you take that that approach, that that legal approach or the law enforcement approach, um, that then shuts down the therapeutic relationship. And that person, if they are the Jake, um, you know, if they they end up getting an abscess or um, uh, something like that, they won't come back to you. So, I'm I err on the I'm a harm reductionist. Um, I'm I'm not saying to people don't use something. Um, I'm saying to people if you're going to use it, know what you're using, and if you don't want the negative effects, then don't use it. Um, but I want people to do do things safely, and I want them to be able to approach people for help 
when they need it. And that may not be when they're sitting in front of you, it may be at a later stage. So, um, and also, as I said, right from the beginning, some people have got legitimate scripts for these. Um, so it's uh, some of the issues that we, we need to start teasing out are, are people topping up on top of what their, their therapeutic dose is. Um, if someone is using therapeutically and getting the benefits from it, um, what do we do in those circumstances? I don't have the answers for that. But um, yeah, I, I think we, we don't have to assume that everyone is using illicit stuff. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Right.